typically in a co-founder relationship, you're going to be in a stressful environment more often than you will percentage of time a romantic relationship. In a romantic relationship, you have tools to blow off steam or build connectivity. Things like, let's cuddle on the couch and watch Netflix. Let's go on vacation <laughs> together. So as a founder Central catcher, ends. like, hey, we should, you guys should cuddle and watch Netflix, you know? Just right, like. <laughs> right. Hey, co-founders, welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins, a podcast where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies, discussing everything from the wins and losses of entrepreneurship to the next steps after the exit. To not miss out on these exciting stories, be sure to subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Let's dive in. Hey, guys, I'm excited to introduce Noah Abelson on the Made It podcast. He founded ShareRoot and took a company public and is now a founder coach. He gives a fantastic, candid interview about his experience going to market and navigating life post-exit. We talk about community building, launching international tech companies, and reverse takeovers. I hope you guys enjoy. So you started and you run a founder journey and you're a your founder coach, but what was your founder journey? I'm anchored in a wanting to make an impact and the importance that that feels. Right, the importance I feel around wanting to make an impact and the resonance that that has, right? Really different than having my primary goal be, uh, I need to make a certain amount of money. My founder experience is one in which I uh, didn't have full financial uh, freedom, right? As a result of it, even though I brought a startup public, et cetera, yeah. um, my family and I didn't achieve full financial freedom. So even though I still do need to pay the bills, et cetera, what feels most important to me and most alive and most aligned and not in a temporary standpoint, not like how am I going to feel tomorrow? Like through a lot of like deep digging, soul searching is making an impact. A lot of times yeah. you can build a company, it can grow to a big size, but because of countless different reasons, it doesn't always necessarily mean that you're going to end up post-economic after the deal is done. So yeah, yeah. what led to that? And how are you planning on paying it forward or, or helping other people avoid that circumstance? I remember talking to an uncle at a, at a wedding and I was telling him, I think my goal at the time was like, I want to be able to not have, be able to make the decision to not have to work again. And I was talking to him about it loosely, something along those lines. And he was like, what's your number? I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, what's your number? Like, what amount of money do you need to make? in order to be able to retire. And I was like, oh, interesting. And I hadn't thought of that. And then so I came up with a number. It was probably wrong. It was something like $3 million, two to $3 million. You know, living a modest life, me and my wife. And who knows, at the time we were uh, dating, but who knows how many kids we'll have. This is like 10 years ago, eight years ago. And so I had this number in my mind. So when I went out, fast forward to year or two, when I went out to start ShareRoot, my startup, uh, I had this number in my mind, this is what I need to make. So from the, from the jump, why was I doing ShareRoot? I was doing it in order to achieve my number. So one thing real fast that I would recommend and, and do recommend to founders, who my mentor or informally chat with or, or work with is if your sole motivation or your primary motivation is a certain number, recognize that at some point that is going to contribute more highly to potential burnout for you than if you went in with like, I'm going in with a mission or I care about this specific thing. Do you remember how you were trying to work backwards from that number? Yeah, it was like two to three million, right? Okay, so it was two yeah. or three million and I had this idea in my mind. It was like, okay, this is what I need to hit. This is what I need to achieve. So then I work yeah. backwards from, okay, how much equity will I likely have? And then what could we exit for? And that number was going to constantly change as it did because how much equity do you have, as you know, shifts and changes as the company grows. So for you, were you raising money and was that like part of the journey for for you? It was about a seven-year journey, a little bit more than that, if you count the months that I was building it before I officially found my co-founder and started it. But we started the company in my co-founder's redone garage in Berkeley, California. He was the CTO. I was the CEO. It's like classic Silicon Valley shit, like really classic. We participated in 500 startups. 
we raised, I don't know, a half a million dollars, a little bit more. We generated some revenue. What we were building was fully platform, single platform dependent. We were building on top of Pinterest. Unfortunately, what happened about two years into it was Pinterest sort of decimated its entire initial tech partner ecosystem. So we got into a point where we were like an email away from a cease and desist order from Pinterest. And we had like three to four months of money left in the bank. No fucking idea what we were going to build. And, uh, you know, I was reading the hard thing about hard things at the time. Team members walked in on a random Tuesday morning and, hey, we're doing an early all hands. Why are we doing that? There's nine people on the team. They sit down. We're like, look, everything we've been doing to this day, we're not doing anymore. Everything we've been selling, we won't be selling anymore. Our revenue is now zero on a monthly basis. We have no idea what we're going to build. We've got about three, maybe four months of money left in the bank. You're already getting paid less than industry average. We need to half that. We'll give you more equity, but this company probably won't survive. But we're confident that we can get through it as a group. And by the way, it's the fall of 2014. If you have any plans whatsoever for holidays... You need to, if you choose to stay, you need to promise to cancel every single one of them, including all holiday plans, da-da-da, through the new year. How do people respond? We had, of the nine, we had one person after that meeting. She just instantly broke down, pulled us aside, me and the co-founder, and said, I can't do this. We said, we completely get it. And a part of the meeting was like, this is what we're going to be asking of y'all. You have to be in the office from 9 to 6.30, Monday through Friday, make up time on the weekends, da-da-da. The ideas are probably going to come from you, not us, because there's two of us and there's seven of you, just percentage chance. And we wanted people to decide, are you in or are you out? And so she broke down and said, yeah, I can't do this. So did you read this book in the morning and then you had this conversation like <laughs> immediately after? <laughs> Holy smokes. Yeah, are you getting the vibe of it? Yeah, yeah, I I'm yeah. getting like flashbacks slash uh like scar tissue is starting to itch a little bit. Like <laughs> this is uh yeah that's a that's a hard conversation. So you got people in the room, you got them bought in, and by the way, that like you can only do that like once, maybe twice. Like that's like you're pulling the only card you have left, which is like, hey, we believe in this thing. Let's do this together. Um, what happened next? Yeah. That's all we were saying. We believe in this th- this team. We have no idea what this thing is going to be. And you're completely right. Like my mind is the type that can go pretty binary on things. So I took the book and I was just like, I'm going to follow this thing and I'm going to attach my own like flair to it. Yeah. And I was feeling everything that he was describing in the book. So we came out of it. I'll I'll, really long story short. we, We just started interviewing marketers and saying like, tell us about your day. Like you walk in the office and what do you do first? Like, do you put your laptop down or do you get coffee or like, what do you do? Um, and it was wild. The experience was wild. It was the most beautiful leadership experience that uh, I had throughout that entire time, even including, you know, the years we were public. I'm a public company CEO. Hailed in comparison from a leadership perspective. We did get to a point, which I think is an important uh, topic to bring up, is we got about two and a half months through the pivot or two months through the pivot. And I had gotten to the point with my co-founder, um, his name's Mark, and we called him Macro, who I love to this day, to this moment. He is. He's a beautiful human being. I got to a point where I concluded through so many experiences that there was no way I would move forward with this company if he stayed as CTO coming out of the pivot. I had felt my experience was I was constantly trying to lift the team up and charge us forward through this nearly impossible uh, goal that we had of figuring out what we were going to build and then raise money on it and da 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 in three months, three to four months. And I felt like he was constantly undercutting the effort, not not intentionally, but just based on how he looks at things. Hey, podcast listeners, we are currently looking for sponsors for this podcast. If you guys are looking to connect with other business owners that are scaling and growing their company, and you guys are interested in a spot on this podcast, uh, we're looking for you. So reach out to connertompkeys.com or operatorequity.com, and we're glad to help set you guys up with a spot on this podcast. All right, cheers. Back to the pod. Did he feel like you weren't being realistic or that you weren't facing the challenges that he 
the same as he was or versus seeing it more as like optimistic and I'm leading the team? It was 10 years ago now, so my memory probably won't serve the truth on this. The story I tell myself is that I don't think he knew the impact that I was perceiving he was having or he couldn't get out of his own way in the style that he he constantly questions things and he's not a natural born risk taker yeah it's uncomfortable right probably for him and and probably for uh, people around whoever that leader might be i had a company that didn't work out and i remember being like optimistic to like the very last day uh, like, this is where we're going right like right and uh, if I'm not going to be optimistic, who's going to be optimistic? Right. Right. Yep. And um, there are some people that felt like I wasn't being realistic about the challenges. But in reality, yeah. I'm going home and I'm like in the back of my head or, or in the shower. And I'm just thinking these thoughts of like, what am I going to do? How am I going yeah, to pivot this? Fuck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's kind of those things. And so I, I think I had like a learning from that experience, which is that it's good to be optimistic. It's good to be like, we're going in this direction. But then I always had to kind of have that, like uh, that realistic candor kind of, of saying like, this is concerning to me. Like this is yeah. what we're going through. So how did you navigate that partnership split? Yeah. And by the way, I want to clarify, I don't believe in just like blanket optimism. I think that's fake and people will see right through it. I think it's you need to bring a balance of both. And one other thing that I did experience that's now coming to mind is we would come up with like protocols for like, this is how we're all going to stay unified. And this is how we're going to all push towards the same efforts. And I think my experience was that he would go off and tinker with other things or go off on ideas that we hadn't all agreed upon. And like that just didn't feel like it could work because we were asking everyone to stay aligned. And if we couldn't stay aligned, it wasn't going to work. Yeah, it's do or die time. You have to be focused like buy in on something like that and then you feel like they go off and do another tangent yeah so how did i navigate it i uh two months two and a half months into it here's the picture here's what happened i called a meeting with with macro and i and then they had our head of sales come into the room also just so there was a third person kind of witness it and i said to macro we're both emotional, we're tearing up. And I said to him, I'm calling this because I'm calling this meeting because I need you to promise that if we get through this pivot, you'll step down as CTO. And if you don't promise that I'm walking away now, today, tears flowing, et cetera. He agreed to it. We got out of the pivot and I never pushed the issue. So you have this huge festering issue from so many different directions that I never addressed, which by the way, connects to a part of the work that I do as co-founder coaching. As you said, we're changing all the time. And there's so many other reasons why co-founder relationships are really important to uh, support. Over 60, so just take the stats, over 65% of startups and scale-ups. So we're not just talking startups like Macro and I idea and the, like we're talking hundreds of team members fail due to co-founder relationships. To me, the most common relationship or, or the most similar relationship to a co-founder relationship is a romantic relationship. I agree. And a romantic relationship, what are the differences, right? And romantic relationships are hard and they take immense, immense work. And we have couples counseling and we have these tools. What's the difference? Well, the difference is typically in a co-founder relationship, you're going to be in a stressful environment more often than you will, percentage of time, a romantic relationship, more often. Also, typically, in a romantic relationship, you have tools to blow off steam or build connectivity. Things like, let's cuddle on the couch and watch Netflix. Let's go on vacation <laughs> together. Hey, we should, you guys should cuddle and watch Netflix, you know, just like. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Good Intimacy. for you. <laughs> right. right, right. And it, it, it typically doesn't happen in work for co-founders. So you don't for have those reasons, tools. Yeah. yeah. Your relationship might outlast your business. Uh, uh, how you nurture that relationship is so key. Um, I'm super grateful for the business relationships I've had in the past. Right. So I love that you're focusing on that piece. You're right. There's not enough emphasis on that. It's pretty remarkable that you went from like the all hands conversation of, yeah, 
we need to yeah. build a boat to, uh, hey, we, we built a boat and we were taking it to IPO. Um, yeah. So I would say that you, you probably found the right market. Um, it's crazy because you're seeing so many companies take advantage of like um, uh, private data. And then you went with the counter motion of how do you protect that data? Yeah. Um, and that's what you built your company off of. So how did you identify that niche? Let me give some caveats on this to clarify. Before I say we identified a niche that like was wildly successful and drove a bunch of revenue because it didn't. A light I shone should... and gave you <laughs> the guided way. <laughs> I, yeah, I, should, I should clarify and state that we did well was we listened to marketers when we interviewed them. We identified that there was a gap in one of their processes around user-generated content. Essentially, what was happening was big brands were, again, we're talking 2014, 2015. Big brands were like going on Instagram, going on Facebook, wherever, and Twitter once in a while. And if like you and I were buddies and we posted a photo of us hanging out in a Costco, Costco would just go and like take that photo and then repost it themselves. Well, Costco doesn't want to get in legal issues. And, and there were a bunch of lawsuits that were starting to pop up around this. You can't just go and like grab Connor's photo and post it, Costco. Like you got to get his approval. Yeah, there was like a dollar forty five hot dog and not, yeah. <laughs> Like fun shit, right? Like, like yeah. You, right? Yeah. <laughs> or we've eaten like a whole pizza and then you're onto the hot dog type of thing. And that's what people want to see, right? Like, of course. So we provided, we created a tech platform that made it like two clicks for a brand to request access to somebody's photo. And then that person to like two clicks away, legal licensing agreement, done, signed, they hand it over to the brand. And what you found was a lot of people wanted to do this and they never got any money back or anything in exchange. So we created this platform. We had a bunch of brands who were really interested in beta testing it, which was great. The, all those things went well. I identified through an advisor. Another theme, by the way, is as a founder and an entrepreneur, you got to surround yourself with people who have kind of been there, done that before, because you can't get there to where you're trying to go without the wisdom of others. Because there's so much unknown. And so I had an advisor who was like, hey, I know that you're looking for creative ways to fundraise because I was keeping our advisors close through the whole pivot. He was like, have you thought about going public internationally? I was like, I don't know anything about that, but I'm going to look into it because I'm a little nuts. So I started looking into it. Long story short is on the Australian Stock Exchange, on their primary board there, um, you know, decent sized stock exchange, they have uh, these openings in time, similar to other stock exchanges, but but really big swings where hot industries can come and go public on uh, on their stock exchange, hot industries that are international, and they can go public at an early stage. So I saw a window for that, for early stage tech companies that are internationally based on the Australian stock exchange. Fast forward nine months, it's whole long process, of course, a long process of going, it was fucking nuts. We ended up going public in a reverse takeover, which now in the U.S. is known as a SPAC, right? But you you come into a company that's already sitting on the stock exchange as a shell entity, essentially, and then you turn that shell entity into yours. It saves some money. It saves some time. And that's what we we did. So we went public on the Australian Stock Exchange at the time. We raised something like $10 million. Essentially, see it as like an alternative to a Series A mm. at the time. Yeah. And that's what we did. So all that was successful. We found the big brands. We get them on the beta. We get funding. We go public. What wasn't successful was the execution from there on that platform that we did. We ended up acquiring two businesses along the way, two different agencies, one of which took over a year to acquire. It was wild. That went moderate at best, I would say, which often happens with acquisition. We pivoted into the data and privacy world, which is what you had seen. Weren't able to make it work from building a business around it since. Like just we weren't able to build a successful business around it. I ended up fundraising for ShareRoot over 10 times throughout the journey of looking towards going public and running the company as a public company CEO. So for in four years, 
we fundraised over 10 times. So I'm flying all around, going to Australia, going to Hong Kong, going to Singapore, not acquiring two businesses, not spending time leading the team, both around making sure that we have like a sustainable business and also also just leading people to be who they want to be and working well together. Yeah, it's hard to run a business and raise money at the same time. It's uh, like two jobs. It um, really is. You're looking at two different places, right? You're you're looking internally, you're looking externally at the market, maybe three places. You're also talking to investors. Right. Um, did you raise too much money? No. No. We did no. not raise too much. If if anything, we were actually crippled by our stock price started spiraling downward aggressively. Like we got to a point where like um let's just say right now, today, my equity, macros equity. He touches, I haven't touched my equity, um, is worth like 1% of what it was when we were in public. And we were locked up, so you can't, you know, take the equity out until after two years. But the problem was, as our stock price was swirling downward, we could never raise enough. So we were constantly creating more primary shares, more new shares, more new shares. Instead of doing another 10 million raise or 7 million raise, we do 1.5. We do two. We do 500K. And so it just kind of nips at you, right? You have a, and, a bunch of different pieces taken away. And then what are you doing? You're waiting two months and then you're out fundraising again. Yeah. I, I want to make this point, which is an important one for folks, is, and it comes up a lot in, in coaching, is when you fundraise, you are fully taking on another job. This is not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to carve out 10% of my working time to fundraise or even 80%. No, no, no. You have a full nother job that is going to exhaust the shit out of you. <laughs> it's going to beat you down constantly. Anybody who tells you they like fundraising, it's bullshit. Why are they lying? What are they lying about? That's really the question. Fundraising is hard as hell. No matter how good you're doing, you have to recognize that you're basically taking a step away from the business. Like 90% of what you were doing, you're, you're taking a step away from it. So plan accordingly. So we, we know about what happened. What are some things that get you excited about what comes next? Whenever you're coaching folks, are there any ideas that you find that are, are really fascinating or really grab at you? Yeah, hell yeah. So I'm going to start by saying, yes, I have that thing and I'm spending 40% of my working time on that starting last week. I upped it from 15 to 20% to now 40. So I'm going to say that we can come back to it. I'm now going to dovetail and say, it took me 10 years. I always had this itch in the back of my mind that was, do I want to make an impact in the world? Is that what I'm driven by? Is that where I want to spend my professional time and hours? And I want to note that my live, uh, my, my real life hero, I got to be around for about 10 years. His name's Knut Daibi. This is his Medal of Honor from Yad Vashem. This will all make sense in a second. Say a bunch of words that sound funny. Uh, he's a righteous Gentile, and a righteous Gentile is a non-Jew who saved Jews in the Holocaust. He was a part of the Danish resistance. He was 19 years old at the time. He fully risked his life. The Nazis occupied uh, Denmark at the time, and the Danes saved like 95% of their Jews. So I got to know Knud after my bar mitzvah, and he and I developed a really deep relationship. I have no idea what I would have done if a Holocaust happened around me today or, or back then if I was living. But what I know really resonates for me is the moments in my life where I've taken things that are hard for me and then turned them into trying to reduce the pain for other people in that same realm has always made me feel really good. Mm. So I'm going to connect that back to what I was just saying, which is in the back of my mind, I've always thought, that makes me feel really good, helping other people when I have a negative experience in my life. I created a buddy program in high school. Um, two, easy, two years after I had left my first day of high school crying, saying I'm never going back to high school because I knew the challenge of going to this really unique high school that was super diverse from a bunch of different ways and was really intimidating. And I created a buddy program for all these incoming freshmen. Um, and... That was an amazing experience, right? So again, the back of my mind, I've always thought, what do I want to do with my professional time? As I start ShareRoot, my startup, so this is a long time ago, 
still in the back of my mind, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? So I start ideating around this and it took me 10 years to figure out question number one, do I want to make an impact in the world? If yes, what is that impact going to be? Again, we'll get there. But to your point about entrepreneurs, I think that post-exit founders, this is a bit bias and will sell, sound like self-aggrandizing, but I believe that this population of people can make a significant impact in the world. And there's a lot of impact we need to make. And it's because they've built things before. So they have the battle scars like you talked about. Some of them have significant financial resources to put towards things. Most of them have an extensive network, like you mentioned, and they're good at seeing problems and building around and fixing them. So I believe we have a need to provide the tools to help post-exit founders figure out whether they want to make an impact and then what the hell impact resonates for them so that they can go out there and get after it and, and make that impact. Hey, podcast listeners. Eight years ago, I started a company called Support Ninja. It's an international hiring, training, managing, outsourcing company to help you find the best talent anywhere. If you guys are interested in hiring international talent, check out supportninja.com. Cheers. What are some things that get you excited about this particular group of people? Or what are the different themes that you're seeing? And then how do you think that you can help them? Um, like execute on those ideas? I left at the beginning of 2019. So we're five years off from that. And I think I'm still experiencing my thought patterns and the way I look at the world, I think are really common with a lot of post-exit founders who let's say, even if they exited three to six months ago. But to me, it's like, you come out of it, you feel like you're, you know, the king of the mountain. And, and then you quickly <laughs> realize like, whoa, hold on. I feel lonely. Yeah, I made a bunch of money, but that only felt good for like the first week or two, if you did make a bunch of money. Everybody around me thinks my life should be the most amazing thing. I'm not feeling that. So you've got this cognitive dissonance. I thought it was going to feel amazing. I'm not feeling that. I don't really have anyone I can talk to because like hardly anyone around me is a post-exit founder that's pretty fucking specific. You see a very large rate of like depression and um, in some cases suicide with founders, even post-exit. Um, and there's a little bit of a deficit from going from like, I'm responsible for these issues and these people and these problems to I'm not responsible for anything but myself. And how important is it to be responsible for 10 people's livelihood, a hundred people's livelihood, a thousand people's livelihood. And then that's completely stripped away. And not that it's all roses and beautiful while you're doing that, but like the shift of responsibility and purpose is massive. Yeah. And then it's like, what's next? Are you going to focus on being a father on, uh, right. Uh, a lot of people get into health, like, yeah. Uh, figuring out, Oh, what is it? Like, how do I live forever? <laughs> yeah. It's why it really, it's so interesting to see. And you see these patterns, right? Like you, I think you put founders in a room while they're actively founders and you see a bunch of commonalities and patterns. I feel like I'm an imposter. I feel like I don't have enough time. All these things that we experience, same thing post exit, right? I felt like I was going to be on top of the world. I'm not. I'm feeling depressed. I don't have purpose. And my belief system, even though I'm not spending time on this right now, is that if you give post-exit founders the tools to identify whether they want to make an impact, a chunk of them will spend a lot of their time doing that. Right? Like your post-exit founder, if they have the means, right? let's say they have financial freedom, they're going to need to spend some time managing their money. Whether they are post-exit with means or not, some of them are going to dive into the next startup, irrelevant of whether they have the means or not. And what I believe is if you give that entire population the tools to figure out whether they want to make an impact, a large chunk of them will go ahead and spend their time actually doing that instead of building the next advertising tech company, as an example. So I'm passionate about that. I don't have the bandwidth to do it right now. Why do I not have the bandwidth to do it right now? So chunk of my time is spent coaching founders and co-founders. It is fulfilling, but it's not, let's call it like a seven and a half, eight out of 10. For okay. Me. That's pretty solid. That's not, it's, that's not too bad. It, it's really not bad, but I, I strive to get to a nine, 9.5 and that's important to me. 
it isn't yeah. important to everybody and no judgment for folks that it isn't important to. Again, it took me 10 years to figure out that this was really important to me. So a 7.5 and 8 is good, but it's not going to cut it long term for me. This is my own personal journey is to reduce the pain for folks who experience strained family of origin relationships. Can you explain yeah. what that is? Um, yeah. Like- a lot of people struggle with trying to figure out how to be in relationship and what kind of relationship they want to have with their uh, with members of their family of origin. And it's really fucking painful and it's really isolating. There aren't many tools out there. Most trained professionals are quite biased or unable to be supportive. So for instance, like clergy have their bias. Coaches aren't going to be able to go deep on a topic like this often. And even a lot of therapists have a lot of work to do on getting more educated on strained family of origin relationships. Meanwhile, in the media, everything is, you know, like, when are you going home for the holidays? And, you know, you've got like the Coca-Cola commercial and everybody's having a great time indoors and snowing outside. You know, most friends don't really know how to talk about strained family of origin relationships. So when you say strained family of origin, does this mean your family's in another country? Or do you just mean that you have like a nuclear family unit, right? And they're decentralized. The truth of the matter is roughly one third of all Americans are fully estranged, fully cut off from a member of their family of origin. So like, I won't talk to you type of thing. Now, these states, if you're curious, these stages are actually pretty fluid. The like, I won't talk to you and then now I will type of thing. But to get one third of the American population to get to a place where they feel psychologically, physically, emotionally, not comfortable enough to be in communication with a member of their family of origin. These are the most important relationships we have or most formative relationships. It's important to correct that. Most formative relationships we have in our life are are from our family of origin. And so one third of that population doesn't feel comfortable being in close contact. And we don't have the tools to support that population. That's really hard. We have some family that is estranged from other parts of the family. And it kind of takes that like matriarch or, or patriarch uh, like figure to kind of like say like to navigate that or to be that yeah. person that that puts them in a room together or have, helps navigate uh, kind of those feelings. And we don't, not everyone has that person, right? Yeah. And I'm not sure, It's it doesn't always have to be an older person. It can be a younger person, but it's less common. Like normally it would be like the grandmother being like, oh no, you guys need to sort it out. Like yeah, you guys are my children right. and you guys love each other. You're like getting around right. and hash it out. Right. Um, so maybe it's a generational thing, but also maybe it's a distance thing. Right. Yeah. And it's way easier to like, well, yeah, to your point to like live elsewhere and not near each other in the same town. And just to clarify, are you saying that in your family or your extended family, you've seen this happen where a matriarch or a patriarch brought folks together? Yeah, I've seen it happen and I've seen it not happen, right? Like I've seen it like because you have two different sides of the family. Um, I think it's normal for the parent to be like, hey, you kids, um, like uh, you guys can work through this, right? That's normally an uh, an age thing, right? You're not going to have like the younger nephew or the younger cousin be the one be like, hey, come together, Um uh, and so it's just like an observation in that normally it's generational. Normally there's like an age element of, of like healing family differences. And I think there's also a distance bias towards that's a little hard to overcome if you're far away. I think what I've found through the research that I've done is in sometimes bringing folks together in sort of a mediation context, whether through a professional or someone like a patriarch or matriarch of the family, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't to the goal of which it sounds like is what you're talking about to the goal of like, hey, let's get everyone back in communication because sometimes, you know, both both parties may not feel comfortable about doing so. So to me, me the right answer is the answer that is genuinely within each of us. So in other words, if you and I were cousins and you genuinely deep down, once you had the time to process through it and think through it, felt like, you know, it just doesn't feel comfortable or safe for me to be in contact with Noah. I think that's the right answer. 
Yeah. Is this going to be uh, like a business idea or is this going to be, how, how does it, how are you going to tie it in? I'm not completely sure, right? Like, is it going to be a B Corp? Is it going to be a nonprofit? I'm not completely sure. Um, it will be the thing that I spend all of my time doing professionally. Yes. And my goal is to have as much of an impact as possible because just like I had mentioned about like the impacts in the world that we need to make, there's a lot of work to be done on this one. You've got higher suicidality rates, higher mental and physical health issues amongst this population, 90 million people in the U S alone. So we got a lot of work to do. I pulled up a graph on this other screen and it was a, a graph in an article that I think a lot about, and it was talking about your time spent with your parents and your immediate family and how it almost immediately falls off a cliff after college. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, it's very stark. It's very like daunting. And it makes you think about like, yeah. how can you bring people together? How can you uh, cherish this time? Um, and that's a big priority for me is how do you build a community around your life if, as far as like family and friends? I think that's super important. I'm a little curious about what that counter movement is going to be. Are we all going to yes. be setting up our, our own communes? Are we going to have like shared chickens right. and uh, uh, shared childcare? Like how are we going to have a... Yeah counter movement or a little bit more around uh, immediate family and community and stuff like that. I love what you're saying. I'm interested to hear more about your interest there. And I, from the research, the little bit of research that my wife and partner Liza and I have done is it seems like there are more intentional communities popping up that are like doing kind of like what you were saying, right? Like communes in, in ways. And there's some interesting ones that are also popping up that are bridging like the age gap. So they're bringing like younger, you know, like teens and 20s into the same space as older folks uh, who are like retirement um, so that there can be wisdom sharing passing through. There can be like the energy and capability from these younger folks passing up to the older generations who are often kind of siloed in our society and like go going to this old age home. Um, yeah, so there's interesting stuff. And the other thing I want to mention is I recently listened to a podcast interview. I forget his name. He was on Dr. Becky's podcast. Um, and he's talking about the issue with just technology and how it's pulled us away from each other. Like to your point, there is, we can live these siloed lives, lives physically, but the amount that we've siloed ourselves into just this action is massive. If we're talking about uh, shared living structures, like how do you buy land, subdivide, and build? Or Ooh, if you go yeah. into other countries, right, and you'll see old people everywhere, like they're uh, still living with immediate family. They're going right. to the grocery store. If you go to the United States, you don't see any of that um, because they're all in dedicated spaces for them. And so to your point, right. if we can start looking at like uh, – shared living with multiple different generations. It changes the economics of the country and that like, instead of that money going to retirement homes and to hospice care, it's actually kept inside the family. I mean, hell yeah. Has cultural implications too. So, um, it's interesting to see, um, Noah, where should people go to find you? We're at the, we're at time for the pod. My LinkedIn or my website. And I assume you can post both in there. But my website is foundersjourney.io. Foundersjourney.io. All right. Noah, thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate it. Connor, thanks, brother. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.